fabulous show. Alaska. I heart beat Alaska. It's hard. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley the Indian and the Welcome to Harpy Alaska Native News. I'm Jeannie Green. So nice to have you with us sitting in front of your television set. I hope you're nice and cozy and warm. Today's program, we travel to Nome, Alaska and take a look at a very serious issue, issue of suicide. And we meet some of the people that are our heroes. They're working to save our people's lives. It's a great show and I'll be back right after this. Hey, Hanipisi. Hello. How are you doing? Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. See you later. This program was made possible by Coeric Incorporated. Thank you, Coeric, for your generous support. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is also sponsored by the Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation, serving the fisheries of the Bering Strait region. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. This program is also brought to you by ASRC Energy Services, a subsidiary of Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. Heartbeat Alaska is also made possible through the support of Norton Sound Health Corporation. There's war going on, a war against suicide. People in Nome, Alaska recently met gathering experts from around the world to discuss how to save lives. Jones Wonkatillon walks the streets of Nome. He's proud of who he is. You see, Jones is a hero. He works to save lives all over Norton Sound. Yeah, I work for Norton Sound Health Corporation under the heavy health service. He knows what does make a difference. He knows what he does is worthwhile. But he wasn't always like that. Years ago, as he walked these same streets, he felt worthless. Back then, you know, um, I used to drink a lot. I used drunk a lot in those days. I remember um, I, I, I wasn't living like uh, by myself today. I used to live with my parents, um, even though I was an adult, because it was a place for me to sleep. And, and even though I do go to work, um, I still live with my parents. Um, during those times, you know, um, my parents and my brothers, because of my drinking, I, uh, they used to put me down a lot, that I was no good, nothing but the drunk, and, and it get to me. Um, uh, because I realized today I was like that. During those times, you know, I hide bottles, steal bottles, or even steal stuff to uh, support my habit of, of, of drinking. And then to the point where, um, you know, all this time when I was doing that, you know, my brothers and my mom and dad always say I was no good, nothing but a drunk, to the point where I really hated myself. 
the whole world stinks and I just want to do away with myself because I was so full of anger and resentment uh, that I really wanted to hurt them. So I took a whole bunch of uh, sleeping pills in, in order to uh, and drink a half pint of uh, vodka during the, it was month of July where in the sea walls here in Rome, uh, where I was hoping I would just pass out and people passing by would say, oh, he's just passed out, he's just sleeping it off. It didn't happen that way. There he was, another drunk passed out on the street. He thought he'd never wake up, but he did. I thought I was crazy for doing this stuff. I found I wasn't. It was alcohol that was doing to me. When I realized and I went to treatment, um, in the treatment, I, re, uh, I find out I need to work on me. And it wasn't my parents or my brothers that was doing this to me. It was me. I had to work on myself. That means I had to go back and, and also um, I didn't realize that I was carrying around my grandmother and my nephew and my cousin's death for years. I had to get rid of him, let him go. Fortunately, Jones was able to use the memory of his dark days to help others. But his story is all too common. Alaska has the highest suicide rate in the country, and the Norton Sound area is especially hard hit. But it didn't used to be like this. This is Daniel Carmen. He lives here in Nome with his wife, Ethel. When Daniel was growing up, he didn't even know what suicide was. He'd never heard of it. Well, as I was growing up in Deering, we had a Jap Japanese person that committed suicide in, on New Year's, and that was our first, you know, evidence of something, someone taking their lives. Daniel and Ethel are a window into the way life used to be for the Inubiat. With the days that our people live nomadic lifestyles when the sailing ships from the other states began coming up it was on the Bering Straits where they would hunt and it was the beginning of uh, smoking drinking alcohol and certainly it, you know took the lives of many of our people at that particular time until we began to learn what the effects were for that. We didn't have radios beginning in our lives. We didn't have TV. And we was always helping the family unit to work. And I would hope it would be something that our youth today are realizing that we need to keep our minds busy in something that'll help our elders and our parents. Just, and I think today, with the modern times we have, we have so many new things that kind of distracts us from helping our parents and our elders on food gathering. And our young people today are forgetting that method of learning how to preserve food so that we could have something during the course of the winter. And I think that's what's uh, kind of getting a lot of our youth Times have changed in huge ways over the course of Daniel's life. In many ways, life for today's youth is much easier, more comfortable. But something was lost along the way. Something that's hard to put your finger on exactly, but it's a void that can easily be filled with darkness. Henry Titus knows how that feels. It built up through the whole winter. Um, I was having problems with, with my girlfriend and and some other family problems, small things. They just all built, it just all built up and didn't feel like I want to go through it anymore. So I tried taking the easy way out but failed and learned a lot from that. One of the things that I learned is uh, life is too big to throw something away. You got to keep going on. Life goes on to think about the people that you could uh, hurt. And that was a big eye opener. Henry knows what he did was a terrible mistake. The emotional pain does not amount to your physical pain that you're going through. It hurts. <laughs> when I think about it, I wish I never did that. 
One thing I never did was ask for help to, when, after I did that and tried it, talking to people, just getting, getting what I had inside me in for a long time, getting it out really helped me out. So don't be scared to ask for help when you need it. Today, Henry is glad for all the moments he gets to spend with his friends and family. But for too many other young people, those dark days lead to tragedy. From here, on the shores of the Bering Sea, across Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, the Inuit people are grappling with the same problem. It's become so much of a problem, it has its own name, the Inuit suicide profile. Like Henry, young Inuit all over the world feel isolated and trapped between the grounding of traditional culture and the need to fit into modern society. Okay, here we go. One person who knows this all too well is Mike Hannigan. He spent the past 20 years of his life in Nome working to turn this trend around. When I moved to Alaska 20 years ago, Western Alaska had uh, the highest rate of suicide in the nation. Uh, when I came here, there were three other clinicians. I think I made the fourth clinician coming to Nome. Uh, since that time, Norton Sound Health Corporation, Coeric Incorporated, a number of other agencies have established tremendous services, uh, village-based, community-based, uh, region-wide. I think they're excellent services. Uh, there are people, uh, you know, at all levels, all education levels, uh, providing uh, services to people in need. Twenty years later, uh, the suicide rate's still the highest in the nation. So today, he's doing something really big. change what we don't acknowledge. Uh, if, we, if we maintain the status quo, we're going to continue to read in the paper about young people killing themselves. We're going to continue to see uh, friends and family uh, and the communities uh, suffer a tragedy after tragedy. So we need to do something differently. And not that we haven't had conferences before, not that we haven't tried before, and we've done a lot of good work, but here's a fresh start, and we're hoping to re-energize our efforts. Uh, this is not a problem that's uh, isolated to Alaska, and certainly not to Western Alaska. Uh, but you know, Australia, New Zealand, Nunavut, uh, we all share a lot of similar concerns, a lot of parallel issues. And that's why we're bringing all these people together. Proud, happy people got so much more to help for. Oh, oh. The people spending three days in this room are all heroes. They are the people on the front lines of the fight against suicide. They are counselors from the region, educators, and social workers. Mike has also gathered experts from all corners of the world. Guest speakers came from as far away as Australia and Israel. There are also guests much closer to home, including this man, Gene Tegman, a clinket from Juneau, Alaska. Let me see here. Come on up here. Yep, yep, you right there. Come on. I wasn't pointing at you, but you can come up up too. <laughs> Grab that note right there. That knot right there. Alcohol and drugs. There you go. Patty, get up here. Okay, your alcohol and drugs, you're myself. How about fear? You want to be fear? Okay, we need a, um, we need a guy up here. Big guy, come on up here. Which one do you want to be? Okay. Anger. Ooh, there's a good one right there. There's anger right there. Let me get another guy over here. Come on right there. You right there. Yep, come on up here. Be guilt. <laughs> we got guilt there. Low self-esteem. <laughs> there you go. And it's connected to all these things here. So he wants to go out there. He wants to get what do you want? He wants freedom. You guys just stay there. Go, go get freedom. Go. <laughs> go. 
But he's trying to get freedom here, but he's connected to all these things. He's connected to everything here. It's stopping him. We cannot change what we don't acknowledge. We cannot change what we do not acknowledge. We have some stuff that's going on in our villages. We have some stuff that is going on in our, in our community. We have stuff that is going on in our own lives. We have got to acknowledge this stuff. We have got to make it public. And not only acknowledge it, but we have to come up with some solutions. And as our speakers, Annette said earlier, all these here are contributing factors. All of those are contributing factors to suicide. All of them. All of these things. So what do we do? We have to acknowledge these things. We have low self-esteem over here. We have a man over here. He wants to get here. He wants to get free. He wants some self-esteem. He wants freedom. So we have to give him some self-esteem. So what do we need to do? We can go out there and we can sing songs. We can teach this man his culture some stories about his ancestors, being proud of who he is. And within our culture, our people, we had ways to do that. We taught. We spent time with our people. Our family. Family is very important. As you heard on the panel earlier, that breakdown in family was a huge contributing factor to their attempt at suicide. And so he goes, thank you, low self-esteem. I don't need you anymore because I have self-esteem. Go take a seat. So I was able to move a little bit more. And then we have over here, we have... Oh, he wants to be hate, guilt. He wants anger. He doesn't, he doesn't know which one. I think we got anger next to you. I think you were guilt. He's so guilty, he doesn't know what he wants to do. <laughs> that's, how, that's how guilt is, man. So he has to take a look at his guilt. As a man, as a woman, and acknowledge that guilt. Maybe I've done some things wrong in my life. I'm always just thinking to people, we always stood up, and we acknowledge these things. If I did something wrong, I am sorry, please forgive me. And so guilt goes and takes a seat. And then we got anger. <laughs> What's that about? It is time to take a look at that and free ourselves from that anger. That anger. Most Native people we use that anger to motivate us to do something in a good way. We use that anger to motivate us. And if we are angry, we we're, to, were told to go out, go out and into the woods, go out into the water. Let the water take the anger from you. We had our ways of dealing with anger. Thank you, anger. This anger walks away. Huge. <laughs> and the young man, go, go get freedom, go get freedom. Go, go, go. Oh, he's a little bit freer. He's a little bit freer, and he's about to... Got to get past his fears. Oh, nobody will listen to me. Oh, we can't do it that way. We've never done it that way before. If something's not working, try something else. Get past our fears. Get past our fears of trying something different. I see a lot of Native people here, and I see a lot of non-Native people here, too. Non-native people here, learn about these people. Learn about them. Learn about their culture, how they do things. Native people, learn about how these non-native people, learn about their culture, how they do things. Get past the fear of asking. But we say thank you, fear, for being there, for protecting me. But now it's time to step out. So fear goes and takes a seat. And then we have oh, drugs and alcohol around us, surrounding us, wherever we're at. Come on. Drugs and alcohol is there, pulling us back. We try to get away, the drugs and alcohol pulls us back, keeps pulling us back, pulling us back. No, where are you going? We're going to go party. Go take a seat. 
So Al calls over there, and then we'll be happy to finally take a look at myself. And so myself. You stand face to face looking at yourself. A lot of changes. <laughs> But that's how it is when it comes to wellness and sobriety. It could be as different as night and day. A lot of changes. They can't happen. So you say, old self, have a seat. Then we got a young man who's ready to go out and take on the world. Take off that thing there. You don't need that anymore. We got a young man who's ready to go out and take on the world. He's ready to grab a drum and sing and dance. Give this young man a hand. Each week, Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Nutsack. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. Just tell your little brother you forgot to pick him up because you were getting stoned. He'll understand. The Inupiat in Alaska are not the only natives in this fight against suicide. Natives across the state of Alaska from all tribes are joining this effort. And across the borders in Canada and the far north, in the province of Nunavut, the Native people are also joining the effort, an effort to save the lives of their own people. of Alaska are not alone in their struggles with suicide. Far to the east, the Inuit of northern Canada are struggling with the same issues. They are also working on a grand experiment, a dream called Nunavut. From the beginning, the Inuit leadership said no territory, no land claim, meaning they wanted both an Inuit land claim and they wanted the uh, Northwest Territory split in two and a new territory, which is like a state, created that they would be the majority in. Jack Hicks works for the government of Nunavut. He attended the conference here in Nome. So the land claim was signed in 93, and in April 1, 1999, the Northwest Territories was split, and a new territory was created. So it would be the equivalent of, um, you know, the North Slope and Northwest Alaska becoming a separate state. Like, it's getting better. Uh, like, for my generation, I can, I've been helping my own children read. Paul O'Colloch is the premier of Canada's newest territory. On a recent trip to Alaska, Heartbeat Alaska interviewed Paul. He's all too aware of the problem of suicide. As a young man, Paul felt some of the same disconnection and confusion that many Inuit do. We were taught, like traditionally, we were taught outside of the classroom environment uh, where we learned, but we were removed from that and uh, put into the classroom. and. Uh, and uh, the first few years of my own life in school, I don't remember them because they weren't very happy memories. He sees the need to balance traditional values and language with a Western education. 
So we're trying to find a way to integrate it overall, the Inuit language, throughout their school years, so that uh, every student learns Inuit and learns more about Inuit. And, uh, but we need support, supporting materials to do that. So we're developing a curriculum with our elders to come up with that material so that throughout their school lives, they're continually taught Inuit and about themselves. If the rhetoric is, oh, community-based programs can do a better job than the big government, then surely our government has an obligation to provide effective support to community-based groups. Jack Hicks uh, traveled from Nunavut to learn how Alaska is combating suicide. He is also sharing some of the big steps Nunavut is taking. So a number of things have happened this year. Our legislature had a two-day debate on suicide. Uh, that resulted in the call for a task force. So a nine-person task force was set up, uh, all Inuit task force. Three young people, three middle-aged people, three elders. And they toured around to different communities. Um, and they'll be reporting later this month. As the days went by, a spirit of hope and joy began to fill this conference hall. The hope that lives will be saved and the joy that comes from sharing strength and culture with each other. Thanks so much for joining us for this Hartford, Alaska. Part two is coming up next week. And a special thanks to Mike Hannigan and the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Northwest Campus for gathering people together for putting this conference on. What a fabulous, fabulous gift to our state and to all the other viewers that are watching. God bless every single one of you. And remember, part two is next week. I'm Jeannie Green. We'll see you then. Yeah.